Anime and adaptations are a tricky subject to say the very least. Now I'm personally not opposed to adaptation. Most anime are adaptations, so it would be kind of hypocritical to say that I was, but I think we can all agree that Hollywood's forays into adaptation of anime and manga has been lackluster to say the least. This isn't to say that there aren't some good live action adaptations out there. Japanese TV has had quite a few solid ones. Alita was pretty good. And one of the best show I watched this year was a Korean adaptation of a webtoon. But when it comes to the many bad ones, I can't help but have this morbid curiosity about whether there's anything salvageable in them. Was there a tiny diamond in the immense pile of shit that was overlooked due to the sheer volume of terrible decisions made around it? Surely it can't be all awful, right? I'll be honest, I'm stalling. I'll just get right into it. Is there anything worth keeping from Netflix's Death Note? Now let me get what this video isn't out of the way first. I could easily cheat and say that production-wise, this is a well-made film. The practical effects are wonderful, some of the shots are brilliantly striking, and it most certainly carried out its vision with style and panache. The question is just whether that vision should have been carried out. Personally, I genuinely love several of these shots and the Final Destination-esque Rube Goldberg machine deaths with their fantastically gory conclusions. Casting Willem Dafoe as Ryuk stands as the most perfect casting decision of all time, and I like Licky Stanfield's portrayal of Elle for the most part. He clearly understood what Elle was and defended his love for the character even after the movie was universally panned. He also alluded to some of the things in the script changing that he didn't agree with as much, which leads me to believe he really did understand how Elle was supposed to act and was screwed over by the script when they turned him more emotional at the end. A decision the original creators admitted to not liking but being convinced of by the producers. Finally, I respect Adam Wingard for his ability to play heavily into and often subvert genre expectations in his films and do so with crazy style along the way. But, as I already said, focusing on those elements would be cheating in my eyes, because those have little to do with it being an adaptation of Death Note, or how they handled the source material. I want... I want any more pens. Hold on. Secondly, this video is not me trying to fix Netflix's Death Note. I really don't like when people say they can fix someone else's vision. It's easy to sit back and see a finished product and know what you'd do differently. It's another to appreciate the creator's work and try to give them credit where you can, and that's what I'm way more interested in. Am I saying Netflix's Death Note is good? God no. I think it's really funny, for all the wrong reasons, but it's not a good movie and it sure as hell isn't a good Death Note. But. Me being me, I feel I need to find some merit in this adaptation, some decision tweak or change that could actually add something to the lore of the franchise or take it in an interesting new direction. And I think I found it. This scene, right here, is the closest to seeing a proper Death Note scene in the whole movie, is gorgeous, and also presents, I think, the most interesting plot change that the movie could have taken. Throughout the film, Ryuk is displayed as more of a malevolent and scary version of his original counterpart. It's not necessarily a bad change, IMO. He's still there to have fun and watch how the humans will act with the power of the Death Note, but he just does it with more of a wicked and dark joy. He messes with Light as much as he encourages him. He takes pleasure in bringing about the deaths Light writes down. But most importantly, he's portrayed as an ancient being who has been doing this for hundreds of years. When Light receives the Death Note, he notices lots of names already written in it in various handwriting and a note that warns him not to trust Ryuk. Ryuk pays this no mind and even threatens Light when he yells at Ryuk for killing the FBI agents, something he didn't even do. All of this combined with the added rule that Light must use the book at least once every seven days or else it'll be passed on to a new owner brings Light to a new conclusion that the series hasn't tackled yet. What if Light tried to kill Ryuk to stop the Death Note from ever getting into worse hands than his own? Which brings us back to this scene. Light no longer is fighting L, but is asking for his cooperation. He's trying to warn L that what he's doing is dangerous and could cause the Note to end up in even more dangerous hands, and that the real bad guy is Ryuk. Obviously this goes nowhere. 
But what if it had? We see that L snaps and is willing to use a page of the Death Note in the ending, and with L and Light's father knowing for a fact that Light is Kira, there's hardly a place this can go that could still emulate the original story, something the sequel's writer is claiming he's trying to do. Honestly, I say fuck that. Do something new. You're written into a corner already, and the plot has the tiniest way for you to get out of it in a completely unique turn for the franchise. Give us Ellen Light versus the Shinigami, two geniuses working together with their enemy hovering over the two of them, well aware of what they're doing. It's got the same vibes as when L lets Light join the task force to stop Kira, and you could twist it so they both have different goals that they're keeping from one another while trying to stop Ryuk and find a way from preventing the Death Note from getting to someone else. Now this next part is tricky. I'm aware that if anyone at Netflix sees this video and hears the ideas I'm about to lay out, they could be in some legal trouble. Thus I'll give them three easy ways out. DM me and I'll take down the video, no one will ever have to know that you used this idea, and I won't care. Alternatively, if you're that worried about it, Venmo me 10 bucks and give me a writing credit deep into the credits. Again, I don't care. Or if you really like the idea, I'm happy to help write it. <laughs> With that said, here's how I'd lay it all out. We'd start with Light being arrested for being Kira, an announcement to the people that Kira has been caught, and L crumpling the Death Note page he held at the end of the first movie. Regaining his composure and now understanding how Light was killing people, L forces Light to show him the Death Note and, after reading the rules, comes to terms with the fact that Light wasn't lying and that they have to let Light kill someone every seven days until they can solve how to either stop Ryu or the Note itself. This would mirror the isolation section of the original as Light is kept under constant surveillance, either in isolation or being cuffed to L as they work to solve the mystery together. However, while under captivity, Light realizes that he really is the only person who can use the Death Note for good and that he can't trust anyone at all. The Note chose him, and he should supplant Ryuk as the god of this new world. He works with L, but does so while constantly figuring out how to stop Ryuk so that he can be the sole owner of the note. Then something happens. The killings start again, and they're not being done by light. The media receives a message from a second Kira saying that the authorities must free Kira, or else they'll kill many more people, and proves during this broadcast that they can kill with only seeing a face. This Kira 2 is the actual Misa replacement, not Mia from the first movie. Light and L begin to work together to catch this Kira 2 with the goal of now having to destroy both Death Notes. But Light is actually using this as an opportunity to bring Kira 2 under him and use her to kill L and finally get free so that he can return to his rightful place as a god. This whole concept acts as a way to bring the plot back towards the original by taking cues from the manga's second act. Light joining the task force, Misa's introduction as a second Kira with the Shinigami eyes, the isolation section where Light doesn't have free reign over the note or how it's used, and I think I'll keep the ending for myself, just in case Netflix reaches out. And if you're sitting there thinking, that's nothing like the original Death Note, they should never change it like that, then clearly you haven't seen most of Death Note. Cause I have. Most of the things named Death Note Border on fan fiction at this point, and I'm not even sure what's even real anymore. In fact, I've got this sneaking suspicion that the 2017 Netflix Death Note isn't even really an adaptation of the manga, or the anime, or even the 2006 movies, but of the 2015 live action Death Note TV series. Which is my way of saying, I watched way too much Death Note for this, and now you're stuck here with me in a Death Note miniseries of videos. Congrats! So join me next time as I explain what I meant by that when we discuss Death Note 2015, or as I like to call it, Death Note Redux. Thank you so much for watching this, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you subscribe and like and comment. To the person at Netflix who's definitely watching this and definitely loved this video so much, um, my DMs are open, please, please message me. If you want to see me do this with other live action adaptations, finding something, anything good in it, uh, let me know down below. Um, I'd love to do it more. It's, it's really hard, but it's fun. Oh shit, there's a spider. I'm gonna go kill that spider. Bye.